Today we're talking to Dr. Eileen Scully, who's Assistant Professor of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Thanks so much, Eileen, for joining us. Thanks for having me, Rowena. It's really nice to be here in my office. <laughs> Um, now, you've been working in the hospital at Johns Hopkins University, um, kind of consulting on treatments um, for, for patients. Are you still seeing a lot of cases, severe cases in Baltimore? So in Baltimore, so I'm part of the Infectious Disease Service, so our department and our division has been involved in seeing these patients. I was just briefly on the consult service, so had the opportunity to do some direct patient care. We have been seeing about the same census numbers now for several weeks. So although we're not um, reaching over capacity or things like that, there has been relatively small changes um, in terms of just a steady amount of patients in the hospital over time, over the last three to four weeks. So I think it feels like we successfully kind of flattened the curve, but the curve has started to feel quite long. Mm, yeah, wow, that sounds a bit stubborn. And one of the challenges that doctors face is knowing um, what is the best treatment for each of the patients that they're seeing. And, the, and it might end up that there's not just one treatment that's going to fit every patient. What has been your experience on that front? Yeah, so that has been an, an, a moving target as well. So within our division, we have a, a group called our off-label therapy working group, and it's got you know 50 people or so in it. And basically at each meeting every week, we update a document that's called a guidance document. And there's a, an important little thing there. It's not a guidelines because guidelines, we always say we have evidence to support. And so here we're just trying to create guidance, meaning like these are the best things from the information that we have that we think might be useful. And that's a big change for us. We're used to having evidence and being able to say, this is a treatment to use. And it's, it is quite challenging in clinical care to, to feel that way. So we've been evaluating through all of the data as much as we can. There's a team who's been systematically reviewing the literature and they're doing an amazing job. And a lot of different universities around the country and other um, academic hospitals are doing the same. And we don't all come to the same conclusions, which I think is another interesting feature because the, there's only so much data available and, and it's subject to interpretation. So our hospital is also working on a number of clinical trials and we have been actively enrolling patients in some of those, including the NIAID sponsored remdesivir trial, mm -hmm. um, and also working to get online with a few of the other ones. So we have been trying to keep track of what happens to patients at our center, although also trying to keep our, our view looking outwards as to the experience of other centers that are, are ahead of us in this epidemic. And there are just so many potential treatments out there that people are trying. Um, the last time I looked in clinicaltrials.gov, I counted 89 unique drugs that are being tested in the context of coronavirus. Um, I don't know if you're at liberty to tell us anything about some of the drugs that uh, are being tested at your hospital? So we have, um, like I mentioned, we're, we've been in some of these multi-center trials and have participated in others there. We were initially planning to be a part of some of the larger multi-center trials of hydroxychloroquine. Some of those may move forward and some of those may not um, as we iterate through new evidence. I think the nice thing about the NIAID trial is that it was this flexible adaptive design so that they can evaluate data and then change the design as it moves to the next phase to add in new interventions and or change durations or things like that. So that's really a, a, the kind of design that's perfect for this type of disease. And so that's the study that I'm sort of following the most closely with the best probability of really good quality controlled results. Okay. So, you know, to get back to this idea that there's probably not one treatment that's going to work for everybody. Mm -hmm. And you're probably seeing a lot of variability. I mean, we've all heard the data that this disease seems to strike older people and men more severely than it hits younger people and women. I mean, that's a, a gross overgeneralization because of course there are gonna be exceptions to those rules. But having said that, do you think there's some interesting information that we should be trying to learn about sex differences and differences in age, especially maybe as uh, pertains to immunity, how can we start learning some lessons there that might help us deal better with the next time this coronavirus strikes? 
So I think those are really great questions. And um, as you know, I'm very interested in the impact of sex on immune responses, but I think one of the first things is trying to figure out how to ask these questions. So the, with the SARS and MERS epidemics, there was a signal that there was worsened mortality among males as compared to females. And at the time, there were thoughts that there might be an immunologic contribution, but also thoughts that socio-behavioral factors associated with gender may drive that. So increased smoking of behaviors among men in some of the areas that were hardest hit or for um, other areas, changes in how often you went outside and, and how frequently you might be exposed to things like MERS. Um, with SARS-CoV-2, I think the data that is emerging is consistently suggesting that females are infected and infected and efficiently, but that they are less likely to be hospitalized and less likely to die. And I think that is just fertile ground for trying to understand what a protective early immune response looks like. And um, so what is the data to support that? So from the New York studies that were published recently in the largest cohort from NYU and one of the community hospitals, the odds ratio for hospital admission was about 2.8 for men as compared to women. And let's but just break that up out of, that means that men are 2.8 times more likely to be hospitalized to be, than women. Correct, correct. And, and keep in mind that that was a surveillance program where about 48% of the people they tested were positive. So these were high suspicion people who had symptoms. Now, if you look at data from South Korea, actually about 60% of their detection of infection was in women. So even though they also showed a higher risk of mortality among men. So, and in South Korea, they tested people whether or not they had symptoms. And in a study that was just published yesterday in the Lancet Infectious Disease, they looked at contact tracing. So knowing a, a positive case and then identifying additional cases. If they use symptom-based contact tracing, so if you have symptoms, we'll test you. The cases they identified were about 55% men. If they used just contact-based tracing, so tested anyone who had contact, they were 28% men. Oh. So that again suggests that women are being infected and are less likely to have the kind of symptoms that would rise to the level of diagnosis. Yeah, that's really interesting. So this presents a major research problem. If we only study people who are in the hospital, for example, then we're only going to study men and women who, for whatever collection of other risk factors or stochastic random events, happens to have progressed. Mm -hmm. And we're going to miss understanding what the protective early response is. And there's a lot of barriers to studying people who are not very sick. Even when we do this testing, so the nasal swab testing that can be done, those people aren't having blood draws done at that time. And so to set up a, an additional step to collect research at that point introduces all sorts of challenges in terms of personal protective equipment for the people who would be consenting for research and also communicating to the public what the research is that you're doing. So that's something I've been really focused on over the last couple of weeks is trying to find a way to get inside the, some of the immunology that's happening in these people who don't have to come to the hospital so we can better understand what a protective response looks like. And the reason to do that is to understand what kinds of interventions might help other people who were going towards the, the, the bad pathway hold back from that. And also to understand what kinds of things in a vaccine would be a, a protective early response. Um, yeah, I think there's a, um, you bring up a lot of issues there, right? I mean, a lot of the country is in lockdown right now, so it really kind of is not responsible necessarily, or, or certainly not very easy to call people into a, into a situation, you know, put them in a room, say, and for, the, for taking blood samples or doing nasal swabs so that you can do research on them. On the other hand, these are answers that we just so desperately need. As you say, we would love to know what, what is it about women, for example, that protects them from progressing to disease? Because if we knew that, then maybe we could make that into an intervention that could protect everybody from progressing to severe disease. Exactly. And I, I think it cannot be overstated how important research is because, for example, I think the first answer many people have to hearing that is sex hormones must be making a difference. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time studying what sex hormones do to the immune system, and they do a lot. But 
we need to step back a minute from that also and look at the sex by age distribution of data. And it looks like in the countries that break down mortality by both sex and age, even very older individuals, so in their 80s, women are still somewhat protected. And that at that time, it's unlikely that differences in estrogen and testosterone are the major drivers. And so before we rush into administering sex hormones or antagonists or things like that, we have to have a very clearly defined set of hypotheses about what outcome we're aiming for, and also an understanding of whether the data to date epidemiologically supports that this intervention will help. Now, you're alluding to um, the work that you've done during your career looking at sex differences. I've known you for a while. You are an HIV researcher um, back in the old days, so to speak. Three um, months ago. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, what, what do you think you've learned in HIV? What are some of the lessons that you've kind of been able to transfer over to the work you're now doing on COVID-2 from all your experience of being an HIV researcher? Yeah, so I think one of the big things is the point you brought up, which is understanding heterogeneity and disease is under is a huge clue to understanding what is protective. So in HIV, understanding those rare individuals who have different outcomes, whether it's the Timothy Ray Brown cure or the London patient, or understanding how people become elite controllers has has unearthed critical features of the pathogenesis of these diseases and so of HIV. And so likewise, I always feel like heterogeneity is, is a source of power. So if we can look through all the difference and find out where the different points are, we can find the levers to push on and to say, this is where we can make a difference. This is where we can't make a difference. And um, so I think that's the major lesson. Um, the other lesson has been things that I'm sure you have thought about too in terms of stigma and um, understanding that people are, are not the virus that they're carrying, they are people who have an infection and trying to really um, find ways to bring humanity to people who are suffering from any infectious disease, whether it's HIV or COVID. Well, Eileen, I'm sure we're all glad that we have uh, medical experts like yourself who understand the nature of humans and who are um, feeling passionate about finding those levers to press on so that uh, we can find a solution to this as soon as possible. Thanks so much for spending time today. Well, thank you so much for having me and for all of the work that you guys do for all people living with HIV and now for people living with COVID. <laughs>